Good evening. Welcome back to our service tonight. Let's all stand together. We'll sing this first song as we worship the Lord. Save, save. Sing it with me. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. saves me from every sin and harm, secures my soul each day. I'm leading strong on his mighty arm. I know he'll guide me all the way. Save Sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. When poor and need the end all along, he said to me, Come on to me and I'll lead you home to me. Sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. Amen, preacher. If you're saved, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord for salvation. We're going to open up our service this evening with a word of prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Emmett, would you pray for us tonight? Stronger. 
I've got Jesus. How could I want more? Amen? I hope that truth rings true for you. I hope that Jesus is enough for us this evening. Let's all stand together. And we're going to sing this last song, Love Lifted Me. Let's sing out together. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. So much for us singing. At this time, we'll invite our ushers to make their way to the front. Uh, we'll take up our Sunday evening uh, tithe and offering our opportunity to give back to God. So as they make their way uh, to the front, I uh, will uh, remind you that this is our opportunity to show our thanks, appreciation, devotion to our God by being obedient uh, and be willing to give from the abundance of our heart. The Bible tells us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Uh, and so we ought to be happy about it. We can be happy about it and give it, or we can be unhappy about it and he get it anyway. Amen. Uh, we're going to pray over the offering. I'm going to ask Brother Sam, would you pray over it for us? Amen. You can be seated. for me like Jesus. That is the absolute God's honest truth. Uh, we're celebrating Mother's Day. Mamas love us, right? I'm thankful for the love of my mom and uh, what it means to me and how my wife loves our children, but nobody loves me and nobody loves my children like the Lord does, uh, including mom. And I'm not, it's not talking bad about mom because uh, it even pales in, it pales in comparison uh, when you think about uh, fathers, but uh uh, mother's love is great, but the love of our Lord, our Savior, is absolutely amazing. Uh, turn with me, if you will, Judges chapter number 15. Uh, as we are continuing our study, uh, I know I preached a long time this morning, so I'm going to try not to preach a long time this evening. Uh, you've heard that before, and everybody's either chuckling or rolling their eyes. I can, I can hear both. Uh, Samson, uh, uh, we're studying Samson. 
Um, the phys- he is physically strong, recognized for his physical strength, but spiritually he is weak, and we see that. We're going to see it continue on. Really, the, uh, the first part of what we're going to be looking at this evening is, is easier for us to apply, but really we need to see the entirety uh, of the story and how it's unfolding. And so uh, God made it clear uh, that he was going to use Samson to both judge the Philistines and to deliver the Israelites. You can look at uh, Judges chapter 13, a couple of pages back, and verse number 5, we'll look at it in a second. But God made it clear he was going to use Samson in that capacity. Unfortunately, Samson would fall short of bringing complete deliverance to Israel due to having sinful motives in the actions that, uh, uh, that he would do and, and the things that he would involve himself in, the way that he would respond. God knew that, and that's why he promised uh, to Samson's parents, Judges chapter 13, verse 5, For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for uh, the child shall be Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall, what's that next word? Begin. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, as we've been looking at the judges in our studies on uh, Sunday nights already, uh, we see that God used... a uh, uh, judges to, to completely deliver uh, his people from the different bondage that they were in due to their sin. And, uh, and in this case, he's going to use uh, Samson, great, powerful, awesome ways, but because of the sinfulness that rested or resided inside of Samson, that deliverance was only started through his life. I talked this morning, preached this morning on God using us, and I hope that everybody wants God to use their life and to bless their life, but I don't. I don't want to just. I, I don't want to just be used by God. I want to be used to the fullest capacity, uh, to the the utmost, to uh, as much as I possibly can be used of God. That's what I want to uh, to accomplish in this life because that's what He is worth. That's what He deserves from me is a willing heart and a, a desiring heart to serve Him. Samson's motivations are clear. From the very beginning, and uh, as we look at chapter, uh, looked at chapter 14, he is selfish, he's prideful, he's apathetic, and he is consumed with lust. We looked at the, uh, the romance, him falling in love with the Philistine woman in verses 1 through 5. Then we looked at his rebellious heart, his rebellious attitude and actions in verses 5 through 9. And after his desire uh, to marry this Philistine woman was kind of coming to a head and uh, they have gathered together. Mom and dad has done everything that's necessary. He's taken the time uh, to prepare a home and prepare a life for his bride. They go back and uh, last week we looked at uh, uh, the marriage feast, the marriage ceremony that lasted seven days and how uh, uh, right at the beginning of it he posed a riddle. And this riddle was designed to, to both entertain and to bring him a little bit of financial gain because he started gambling from it. But we'll look more about that and uh, uh, or rehearse more of that uh, here in a little while. Um, He is selfish, prideful, apathetic, and consumed with lust. These will continually be the motivations for most of Samson's actions. In tonight's lesson, we'll see Uh, a bit of all of these causing Samson to indulge in a bit of retaliation. Finish the statement. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not our place uh, to retaliate or to take vengeance out on those who do us wrong. We trust in the Lord, His capability, His uh, his ability, his, his moving, His plan, and His purpose, not just for our life, but for their lives as well. So we're going to look at this retaliation, uh, uh, starting in verse number 5, but it came to pass within uh, a while after, in the time of wheat harvesting, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. Now, if you remember from last week, uh, the uh, Philistines, they could not figure out the riddle that he had posed, and there was a bunch of uh, clothing uh, on the line, which was a, uh, a big financial burden, and they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to lose this, 
challenge or this bet. And so uh, they convinced Samson's wife, his new wife, to tell her uh, what the answer to the riddle was so that she could tell them the answer. They would have the answer. And so that's exactly what happened. They threatened her, and she finds out the answer, and then she tells them, and they come to Samson the last day and say, Look, we got an answer. Samson's upset. He is convinced and, and right and, and is being convinced that they manipulated his wife into giving them the answer. It was cheating. But he's willing to keep up his end of the bargain, and he owed 30 men thirty change, or a change of clothes apiece. So the Bible says he goes and kills 30 Philistine men, takes their clothes, brings it back, as a way of fulfilling his debt. And then in a rage, he ups and leaves. Problem is, marriage ceremony has already been fulfilled. He has a wife. That's why it says that he, uh, after a while, uh, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a kid. Not a son or a daughter, but a goat. Amen. Amen. And he said, I will go in to my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, Verily, or I verily thought that thou hatest, or hadst utterly hated her. Therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. Not a very good daddy, right? And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 uh, foxes and took uh, firebrands and uh, turned uh, tail to tail, and put the firebrands in the midst between the two tails. And when he had set uh, the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burn up both the, the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Then the Philistines said, who hath done this? And they answered Samson, the uh, son-in-law of, uh, of Timnath, because he hath taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that, I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of Mount Edom. There's a lot of things that are going on in this. Really, like I said, the beginning of it, we can see a, a more clear application. The, the reality is we, we looked, we finished out our study last week the same way, way we will this week. We see the progression of sin that's unfolding in the life of Samson. Uh, he'll let uh, some little things uh, uh, come in and take root into his life, and with his prideful attitude, his lustful spirit, and uh, with his uh, selfishness and desire to please, number one, above all things, uh, that, that sin didn't just take root. It absolutely flourished in that environment. And he goes from committing one sin to another sin to another sin, growing in intensity every time until uh, we saw last week he was guilty of taking the life of those 30 Philistines. Now, we know that God was going to judge, and God is using Samson to judge the Philistines, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that the way that Samson went about things was pleasing in the eyes of God. The results were what God wanted. But it wasn't, how, it wasn't necessarily how God would have, uh, have ordained for it to be. Now, he, he, uses, uh, he, he uses Judas uh, to accomplish his will and purpose, right, in the New Testament. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean Judas was right with God. That just means that he was a part of the plan and that even, even though he had a rebellious, wicked heart, that God still used him to accomplish his perfect will and purpose. In the same way, the Philistines have been doing that to the children of Israel. Children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and as a result, the Lord used this wicked group of people to bring judgment upon them. And now he is using Samson to bring judgment back on the Philistines because even though he used what they were doing, they were still committing uh, acts of atrocity and uh, just uh, doing wicked things. And so God is going to use uh, Samson for this. So with all that being said, Samson is not, in this time and in this, uh, this story, in this uh, time of retaliation, even though he is a judge of God and God is using him and God is blessed him with an enormous amount of strength, that doesn't mean necessarily that he's walking and talking and, and right with God. We can, we can easily see that he is absolutely not right with God in, in these moments. But what's happened is uh, Samson is, is overwhelmed with sin and the result of his sin in the last study. And so after he kills these 30 and after he delivers the clothes, uh, he, he goes back home. Leaves his wife and goes back home. And in the beginning of our study this evening, we see that after a period of time, he comes back. Here's something that's important for us to understand. We see uh, the reason for this retaliation being uh, expressed to us uh, in these verses. But understand that all sin comes with consequence. Part of that consequence is is uh, the maturing and the growing that we have done uh, in our Christian life when we sin and uh, we allow things into our life that don't need to be there. Uh, it has negative consequence and it takes us out of the good graces of God. And even though we can pray a prayer of repentance, that doesn't mean we get to uh, leap forward and jump over all the wrongdoing we've ever done and get right back to the place that we were before we messed up. We still have to grow. We still have to mature. Uh, as a matter of fact, you look at, uh, at Moses after, after the slaying of the Egyptian. He spent how many years on the backside of the desert? God grooming him and making him into the person that he could finally use to deliver the children of Israel. It wasn't a overnight. Uh, we, our, our forgiveness comes in an instance. We ha have a, a true heart of repentance. We confess our sin. We cry out to God. Those sins are forgiven. Amen and hallelujah. But we still have to grow back to the, being in the place we were before we messed up. There's consequence, and that consequence is, uh, is, uh, is enormous. Here's what happens. Samson comes back after spending time at mom and dad's house back in his own country, uh, licking his wounds and pouting for a while. He comes back, and he, he has a bit of an expectation. The beginning of verse number 1, and it came to pass that while... Uh, within a, uh, a while after of time, uh, in the time of wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my, uh, uh, go in to my wife into the chamber. Samson has the misconception that after going and uh, going back home, spending that time, that now he gets a redo. We can sin, and that sin can be forgiven through true repentance, but we can't take it back. Once it's done, once it's committed, once it's in, indulged upon, we cannot take it back. Just like we, uh, we can't take words back. Sticks and stones will break bones, but, uh, but words will crush, crush your soul and grind it into powder. It'll tear a heart apart. It'll, it'll ruin the entire future of a child just a, a hearing a handful of words that are misguided. Once those words escape our mouth, we can't put them back in there no matter how hard we try. Those actions that we commit, those sinful indulgences, we can't take it back. There is consequence and there is, uh, uh, sin is corrosive and uh, there is fallout that happens as a result of us indulging in things that God says are absolutely forbidden. We don't get redos. Salvation is repentance. 
in redemption. I don't have to pay in eternity the, the debt of sin that I have accrued for myself because Jesus has already paid that price. But the Bible still tells us we reap what we sow. That means if I sin, I can be forgiven, but there are still consequences in this life for my sin that I still have to answer for. And so he is expecting some sort of a redo. I'm just going to go back, uh, take my wife, and uh, I'm going to bring her this gift, and uh, everything's going to be hunky-dory. I'll just go back and fix. I'll just go back and fix things, and I'll purpose in my heart to do better this time. Problem is, he doesn't get a redo. And as a matter of fact, he brings this goat. It's a. It's the idea of uh, of him bringing a gift, buying flowers, because you spent too much at Bass Pro Shop. I'll just pay off any debt that I have accrued. Now, the, the contract, if you will, had already been signed. The commitment had already been made. Uh, uh, Timnath's daughter was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, to marry Samson, and Samson was to take care of her, and Samson leaves her high and dry, and so now mom and dad are continually having to look after their daughter, which, which obviously isn't a, a burden for uh, loving parents to go through. Um, but it wasn't part of the arrangement. So he brings back this kid kind of as a peace offering. I'll just pay it off. The, real, the, uh, the, the, the unfortunate reality is this. There are no redos when it comes to sin, and there are some things that are, it's going to take a little bit more elbow grease, a little bit more effort, a little bit more uh, than just a little bit of money for us to get over and get beyond. There, uh, sometimes uh, uh, when we've done someone wrong, when we've hurt someone, injured someone, uh, spiritually, uh, physically, whatever it is, there are some things that money just can't buy. you got to earn trust again, right? You, you, you ruin somebody's trust or you uh, negatively affect their trust in who you are. Trust is something that's earned, right? So he's expecting to be able to go and just pay off this debt, and the reality is uh, there is still a sin problem. Because with all of this, with this desire for a redo and uh, willingness to, to repay any debt that's accrued to, to her mom and dad and bringing this gift, this goat, even with all that he's trying to do, there's still consequence for his sin, and he's never shown a bit of repentance. Desiring a redo and wanting to do things better, that's not repentance. Having a, a willingness to repay a debt, that's not repentance. Repentance is turning from your sin, hating it and confessing it, uh, turning from it and, and making the vow and the commitment not to, not to go back to it again, not to, uh, to do that anymore or be involved in that anymore. And there's no repentance in Samson. It says that his, his mindset is that he would go into the, uh, the chamber with his wife and kind of pick up where, where he had left off. His desire was for a redo. He was willing to pay it off, and he thought things were just going to return back to normal. That, were, that was Samson's expectations of this situation. Problem is, nobody else saw it his way. As a matter of fact, we, we see as we continue the, uh, Samson's actual experience. What did Samson experience when he got there? Uh, he, he wanted to go into a, a chamber with his wife, but her father would not suffer him to go in. He stopped him. He said, whoa, what do you think you're doing? Well, I'm going into my wife. And her dad forbids it. He says, it's not proper. It's not the right thing. And he's going to reveal to her, I've already given her to marry another man. You've messed things up and there are consequences because of your sin. And even though you want to redo and you want to repay and you want things to return back to the way that they were, there are already other wheels or already other uh, balls that are in motion. So Samson, upon returning, he was forbidden to go into the chamber which would have resulted in frustration, understanding that the most powerful, the strongest man in all the world in the history of, 
uh, of humanity, with that would, would come a little bit of pride, right? Right, fellas? I mean, if you're the best, if you're the strongest, if there's nobody that can even come close to comparing with you, you can understand a little bit of pride welling up, and it's obvious in his life, but as he is forbidden to go through, even though he's willing, even though I've done what says, hey, hey, I brought a goat to repay, and I want things to go back to the way that they were. He's frustrated because he's not getting his way. Problem is, he's not getting his way, and he has nobody to blame but himself. That's what sin does to us. It makes us think uh, in a corrupt manner. We don't see things uh, the way that they actually are. Every sin comes with consequence, and uh, every sin is corrosive, and every sin is harmful to, uh, to homes, to individuals, to relationships. The fallout is this. That woman that he had fallen in love with, love at first sight. He was willing to sacrifice everything to go and to marry this forbidden woman. He was given the opportunity. They went all, he had prepared home and they had prepared the meal and invited all the guests and, and the whole week ceremony, the, uh, the, the wedding week of the, the union of these two individuals, it had already taken place. And he walked away from it. He stepped out. And there was major fallout as a result of it. There was sin on, uh, on this woman's part. She was willing to betray her husband, even though it was under fear and threat of life. It was still sinful that she betrayed her husband. But that's not the reason for the the fallout, the fallout is all due to Samson. Samson was given an explanation from, uh, from her uh, father. And her father said, I, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. My, my assumption was that as a result of uh, what she had done and, and uh, uh, the consequences thereof, how you responded, how you reacted to it. She hadn't heard from you so, uh, in the whole, uh, the whole um, uh, growing season of the wheat, and she, now you're coming back to get her. She hadn't heard anything from you. We all thought that you hated her, that you walked away uh, from this marriage. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. I gave her to marry somebody else. There are parts of this and aspects of it that we could understand in a time where, uh, where this woman would have been ostracized and, and could very literally have starved to death if mom and dad hadn't stepped in and, and taken care of her. Someone else hadn't stepped in and, uh, and been willing to marry her. She would have been an outcast. And so we can understand parts of it, but, but even with that in mind, it's still an evil, wicked mindset to just give her away to another. But then we see uh, the, the progression of evil being revealed in this woman's dad. She is a Philistine. The Philistines are a forbidden people to marry uh, into, not because of uh, color of skin and not because of uh, the region or not because of a financial reason. Uh, the Lord had absolutely forbid the children of Israel to marry into the Philistines because they were pagan, because they were consumed uh, with uh, uh, idol worship, they were consumed with sacrifices, they were consumed with, uh, with uh, selfishness and pride and all sorts of uh, 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 selfish or, or physical indulgences, if you will. And so her dad says to Samson, who he's afraid of Samson because, again, Samson has a reputation. He says, by the way, her younger sisters, she's even prettier than she is. Why don't you just take her to be your wife instead? So the explanation that was given to Samson was, we saw your action. We saw the way that you had responded to what she had done and what the, the 30 guests had done. And based on your response... We assumed that you hated her and was done with the whole thing. 
So we made her available to others, and she married another. But then we see the, in the reason for this retaliation, we see Samson's enticement. This woman that he had married, it was already forbidden, right? Say amen if you're with me. It was, it was a forbidden marriage. It was sinful. It was rebellious. It was something he should have no part in. He was wrong uh, from, from day one. He was wrong uh, from the, the first word, the first action of trying to get this thing accomplished. There's never been a sin or a temptation that once it presents itself and once an individual gives into it, that sin and temptation just leave you alone now. No, it's always accompanied with something else, something greater. Sin is a snowball effect, a domino effect. Uh, lust bringeth forth sin, according to the book of James. Uh, lust bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth. It's progressive, right? And, and it's a corrosive nature. Uh, and so Samson's enticement was uh, from this man. He, he was enticed to greater pleasure. Now, I know that you fell in love with, based on her beauty, I know that you fell in love with my first daughter, but I want you to understand her younger sister is even prettier. So he's enticing Samson to go further in his rebellion and further uh, in his sin, right? Not, not only is he uh, offering him greater pleasure, uh, but he's offering him to go into a greater rebellion. So uh, not because he, he still did get married to the first one, right? And so now you're going to, uh, to marry a second forbidden woman. So uh, it's a progressive thing, and it's hidden. It's cloaked. It's not presenting itself that way to Samson. But we can see the way that it's going. This greater pleasure that's promised, this greater rebellion uh, that, uh, that, it, uh, that, it, uh, that it must take in order for him to indulge or uh, to give in to this enticement, it comes with greater consequence. More sin, more judgment. More sin, more consequence. You can't break the law but so many times without it catching up with you. The more you break the law, the, uh, the, the greater and the, uh, the more steep the punishment is going to be. And so even though he's being enticed, he doesn't give in. That's the reason for this retaliation. So next we see how he retaliates, the response of this retaliation. What is it that Samson does? Now this is a, a, a portion of this story uh, of Samson that so many skeptics will say that just it couldn't happen, it would be impossible, and uh, it's far-fetched and fairy tale. Uh, our God is the God of the impossible, correct? He has done greater, more powerful, more awesome, more... Uh, uh, more amazing things than what we see uh, Samson is going to be able to do. Because remember, even though Samson is not right with God, he has still endowed him with a great amount of power, right? And so what he does is, uh, is a supernatural thing. But we see the, the response of retaliation. Uh, and Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them this pleasure. In this response of retaliation, he, he starts off with a defense of this retaliation. Before he does anything, he starts defending himself. His defense is actually showing the level of corruption that his heart and his mind have reached. Samson justifies his sin by saying he would be more blameless. What he is going to do and the way that he is going to respond to where this is going to take him, it's a progression of things getting worse and his sin growing and maturing and taking root and flourishing in his life. But he justifies it and says that I'm going to be more blameless than the Philistines. If you just look at that one statement, it kind of, it's weird how it just appears here. But what it is, is that the Lord has already convinced him. He is already feeling conviction for what he has done. He, are, he knows that he had done wrong in the, in the gambling and then the, uh, the killing of those 30 uh, men. And he knows that he has done wrong by, uh, by leaving his new wife high and dry. He knows he has done wrong. But he says, I'm going to be more blameless than the Philistines in this situation. 
He's justifying his actions of sin before he even follows through with it. If that's not a picture of what the Christian will, will do, if we're not careful, if we don't keep uh, 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 short accounts with the Lord, if we don't, uh, uh, if we don't uh, walk with him and talk with him and pray and study the word and be willing to listen to the Holy Spirit, if we're not faithful uh, to answer when he calls, we will be just in this exact same situation where we're willing to justify sin before that sin's even committed. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, it's only going to show it for a couple of seconds. I'm used to it. I've seen it all before. I've been there before. I've tasted it before. I know the effects of it. It, it doesn't have the same effect on me that it has on others. It's not as big as some of the other sins. I have bigger things in my life I'm trying to work through. That's a uh, small potato. It's not that big of a deal. We're really, really good at justifying our wrongdoing, right? He's justifying it before he even commits the sins. He's justifying it. Understand, he is a judge. He is being used of God to bring judgment on the Philistines, but he's also bringing, uh, being used of God to bring deliverance to the children of Israel. But just because he is justifying his sin does not make him justified. Even though we can convince ourselves and lie to ourselves, even though we can come up with all sorts of excuses as to why it's okay for us, it is still sin in the eyes of God, and that sin still comes with major consequence. His defense doesn't just show his, uh, the level of his corruption, but in this defense he also shows his own confession. The word that he uses now now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines. Giving the understanding that he knows the level of his sin has already made him equal or less in the eyes of God to the Philistines. But now, based on what they have done, based on me uh, showing some retaliation and me uh, making things right because they have done so much wrong, based on the way that they have treated me, that makes it okay. Or well, no, you're still wrong. You still need to repent. You still need to get things right with God. And after you've got things right with God, you still need to get things right with man. With the, uh, verse number 4, after we've seen the, in verse 3 the defense of his retaliation and the details of the retaliation, the Bible says that he caught uh, 300 foxes. Um, it doesn't... Well, the foxes... First of all, according to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 27, a fox was an unclean animal, especially for a Nazarite. And so him coming in contact with a fox or a jackal is something that would have continually, progressively made him unclean. He's already unclean from touching the carcass of the lion. He's already unclean uh, for partaking in uh, uh, the, uh, the, the marriage, of this forbidden marriage. He's shown himself over and over walking through the vineyard. He's unclean because he's come in contact with these, uh, the, the, these uh, uh, grapes that grow on the vine, all these things forbidden for a Nazarite. And now he's continually going deeper and deeper and deeper. You say it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's just a fox. It's a big deal when the Lord says it's a big deal. We, we, don't, we don't get to make the judgment. We don't get to say what's okay and, and what's not that big of a deal. So these foxes were unclean animals, Leviticus 11, uh, 27, and whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean unto you. Pretty clear, right? The foxes were also, as he has collected them, caught them, he's tying them together, and then as he's tied their tails together and uh, uh, fire bands, uh, he, he lights them on fire, obviously the, the fox would be a little bit scared, right? Uh, you ever seen a, a wild animal that gets scared and it just takes off like a, a bullet right out of a gun, Right? Uh, you can imagine. It, it, again, it doesn't tell us how long it's taken, the, the, the progression of time that's going on here. Uh, all it tells us is that he has caught 300 foxes. He has trapped them. That's the word that's used here. He has trapped them. He has tied them together. Uh, lights or tails on fire as he's tied them together. 
And as soon as that fire is lit, they just take off running just as fast as they can. A fox is naturally going to go to uh, 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 thick wooded or, or uh, thick brush anywhere that it can go to uh, to try to get a little bit of, uh, of peace and, and a little bit of uh, calmness. It's going to go to a place that that uh, that offers it a bit of safety, so it runs as fast as it can, and it's going to run to things like vineyards and things like grain fields. They would run as fast as they could to the crops, to find cover, any cover that they could. The foxes, according to skeptics, were unreasonable to accept as true. We know that our God is the God of the impossible. If the Word of God says that it happened, we believe that it absolutely happened. Inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God, we take it at face value. But with this story, we've seen greater things take place, especially in in the life, the ministry of Jesus Christ. We've seen greater things happen. But with that being said, it does not uh, state how long it took him to trap these 300 foxes. That would not have been an impossible task given the right amount of time. It's not that it doesn't say that he went and and snatched them up barehanded. It says the the word that's used here is that he trapped them. So it doesn't tell us how long it took, but that he had trapped 300 foxes. It doesn't say the length of time it took him to burn down the cornfields, the vineyards, or the olive, uh, uh, the olive, uh, olives. um. So with those things being said, that the, I can't see why that that they would think that this was an impossible uh, thing to happen. The Lord says it happened. His word says it happened. We believe it. Faith accepts the impossible and says that the impossible absolutely is possible. That's what faith does. And so we see the, uh, the details of this retaliation, the defense of his retaliation, then the destruction uh, that came as a result of his retaliation. Uh, it destroyed their food source, right? Grain, corn, uh, vineyards, olives. It destroyed all of it. It wasn't just their food that was now taken. Now uh, it also affected their finances. It destroyed their way of uh, providing for themselves because they wouldn't just eat and consume. They would sell these things. But probably the biggest thing, what leads to the, the next portion, the destruction of this retaliation brought by Samson was the destruction of their fame. He trampled all over their pride and humiliated them. And nobody, especially the lost, is going to take that sitting down, right? So his actions, sinful actions of, remember, uh, this, this, uh, his response was out of pride, right? And his response was sinful, uh, un- being unclean and uh, dishonest. We see the reaction to the retaliation. After their pride is stepped on, the Philistines starts questioning, who is it that's burned down our fields? Who is it that's consumed all of our crops? Who is it that's done this awful thing? And they said uh, the consensus was it was the son-in-law of Timnath, Samson, is who they're making reference to. And then they give a reason. Because Timnath had, had uh, taken the woman that he had married and given him to another. So what do the Philistines do to this woman and her dad? The very thing that they had threatened him to back at the wedding party. If you don't find out from Samson, the answer to this riddle will burn you, will burn you alive. You and your father. And so she willingly... Uh, uh, defames or willingly uh, uh, takes advantage of or uh, defrauds her own husband to save her own life. And in the end, she died the very same way that they were threatening her to in the first place. After they inquired, they were enraged to find out it was Samson. They were angry. And they were demanding that someone is going to pay for what's done. But again, they're afraid of Samson. 
And their idea, their mindset is he's already angry with Timnath and, and uh, his daughter. And so to show him and to show them, the Bible says that they burned her and her father, probably burned down the house with them inside of it. This was an evil group of people. This mindset and this willingness, this knee-jerk reaction of evil being done to these people, it just shows you how far and how depraved this people group was. No wonder God said, stay away from it at all costs. They were evil. Judges 14, 15, uh, again, and it came to pass on the seventh day uh, that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may uh, declare unto us the riddle, uh, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. And that's exactly what they did. That was the reaction to this retaliation. Samson returns has this great expectation of things just going back to the way they were. The problem is sin had entered the picture, and sin always brings with it consequence. It didn't go the way Samson thought it was going to go, and it went a whole lot worse. The wife that he came back to take, she now belongs to somebody else, and he's angry and starts justifying it, and uh, he he has this willingness to uh, to take it even further and to do harm and to uh, to go further away from the Lord, and his willingness to uh, to make himself unclean, and his willingness to give in to his uh, prideful ambitions. And now this man and this woman that he's upset with, Timnath and her daughter, his wife. Now they've been burned alive. Samson's response unto them, Samson said unto them in verse 7, Though you have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. It kind of gives us the, the idea that, uh, that Samson's understanding was that they had done this for him as well. Somebody had to pay for the destruction, the damage. But in the eyes of Samson, all the Philistines now have a mark against them. So we see his scorn. Samson's not okay with the things that have happened. Samson gives them warning, I'll be avenged of you. I... I you're going to have to pay the consequence of the wrongdoing that, uh, that you've brought upon me. And he's not even sticking up for his wife or her dad. He's, talking, he's only focusing on himself, again, going back to his level of pride. Then in verse 8, And he smote them hip and thigh, hip, hip and thigh with a great slaughter. This phrase, hip and thigh, is an old proverb giving us the understanding that the way he went about viciously and brutally slaying so many Philistines is that he was ruthless, relentless. He didn't show any pride. He didn't show any restraint whatsoever. This was an absolute slaughter. Now, we can't forget Philistines are still under the judgment of God. What is happening here is still a fulfillment of the will of God and them suffering under judgment. They were an evil, wicked group of people. And because of their sin, because of their depravity, judgment was coming home to roost. But that doesn't make what Samson did the right thing. We can't justify... One wrong by another. Two two wrongs don't make a right, correct? Responding to wrong with wrong doesn't work. It's not justifiable in the eyes of God. And so his slaughter was, uh, he showed no mercy, no restraint. It wasn't pleasing uh, the way he went about it in the eyes of God. And it's going to come back to bite him later. But after he slaughters, this great amount of people, it says that he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock of uh, Edom. 
Now, this was a, uh, the, a cleft in a rock. This is a mountainous range. So he goes to a, a high position, and, and he goes up there, and he's stewing, and he's upset, and he's sulking, uh, and he's still angry. Even though uh, he's worked out this anger in slaughtering this people, he's still angry with uh, with the deception. He's angry uh, with the choices that he made. He's angry about the consequence. He's angry with the way people have treated him. Uh, he's uh, so full of pride and so full of himself. He can't even see how he has done wrong and he's brought this upon himself. He is just mad at the Philistines. The idea of him going up and soaking in this cleft of the rock, he's not hiding. He is feeling hurt from the betrayal. He's fe- he, he was betrayed, so he's feeling the hurt of his betrayal. But him spending this time in the cleft of the rock, what he's doing is he's waiting for them to mount an assault against him. He is full of hostility, anger, and malice. He's focusing only on his hatred for the people. He is so consumed with this hatred that he can't see that it all finds its root in his actions. That's what sin does. You look at a drug addict who their life has been torn apart because of their addiction. They're willing to take advantage of anybody and anything. We, we, we've known folks and we've heard stories of and, and maybe even have in our own families. Uh, I, I know I had a cousin who, who, who stole from my grandma. We wanted to kill him, right? He stole from my grandma just so that he could... Uh, sell her jewelry and uh, get enough money to get his next fix because he was doing anything and everything he could just to feel normal again. The high wasn't even there anymore. He just wanted to feel normal again. And when he got caught and when, uh, when, when, uh, when he was addressed and when he was confronted with his wrongdoing, he starts blaming everybody else for the situation he finds himself in. It was mom and dad, and they never told me they loved me. Uh, it was me having to uh, uh, just about raise myself, and uh, I never had. I, I wasn't given the same opportunity uh, my siblings were given. I wasn't uh, excuse, 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 excuse. And they can't see. Am I lying? They can't see that they have done this to themselves. Understand, it's not just drug addicts that face this. All sin does this. Someone whose home's been tore apart because of pornography or uh, because of an extramarital affair, stepping out on husband, stepping out on wife. They want to blame husband or wife, or they want to blame their uh, their situation. They, they want to say, well, I have needs and I have wants not being fulfilled in, uh, in the society in which they live, and they want to blame it on, uh, on their addictive personality that they inherited from mom or dad. They want to excuse it, and they want to blame everything except for themselves. Right? So far in the life and legacy of This judge, the strongest man to ever live, and yet spiritually he was so weak. His story starts off with rebellion against God, dishonesty towards his parents, looking where he shouldn't, walking where he shouldn't, touching what he shouldn't, leading him to compromising his call, justifying his sin, sharing his sin even with his own parents and then covering his sin, downplaying his sin, all that leading to more sin, sin on top of sin, gambling, the sin of pride. Pride is still a sin, amen? Sin of murder. Now in the study we've looked at this evening, the sin of bitterness. Bitterness is still a sin. I've said it before. I heard one preacher say bitterness is like uh, drinking poison and hoping the other guy dies. It doesn't make any sense, and all it does is, is 
negatively affect your life. Bitterness is sinful. That bitterness leads to vengeance. That vengeance is a brutal slaughtering of an entire people group based on Samson being consumed with hate. I'm sure you go back to the beginning and you see young Samson and him falling in love with this forbidden woman, I'm sure he never had in his thought process or he never uh, ever conceived uh, the thought in his mind that it was going to lead him this far. But taking that second look at that forbidden woman was a rebellion against God and that's where it all starts. Sin costs all sin. All sin costs. Sin corrodes. Sin consumes. And eventually, if sin isn't repented of, sin will crush. Unfortunately, it's gone from bad to worse for Samson, but we're not even close to the end. When you get to the end of Samson's life, and we'll close with this, when you get to the end of Samson's life and his final act of, of devotion to the Lord and his final act of judgment, I'm sure there was a bit of the right kind of pride in Samson for finally doing the right thing for the right purpose with the right motives. But I guarantee you if he could go back and start over at that first look that or that second look of rebellion, after that forbidden woman, that rebellion against God, I, I guarantee you, he would have took every bit of it back. The moral of this entire story, this entire study, stay away from sin at all costs. Because I can guarantee you, you don't want to pay the consequence for where, to, where it will lead you.